Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Amanda Petford Long and I'm the director of the Centre for Nanoscale Materials here at Argonne. Um, the Centre for Nanoscale Materials, uh, which also employs Seth, is one of the five uh, centres that were set up by the Department of Energy across the country um, to advance the study of materials and phenomena at the nanoscale, which of course is the scale of atoms and molecules. Um, I'd like you to welcome you particularly to this event this evening, which is the second in Argonne's um, Argonne Out Loud series. Um, the goal in creating this lecture series was really to highlight some of the cutting-edge research that's taking place across Argonne and to try and present it in a way that's suitable for public interest. So we've tried to pick topics that are, we hope, of interest to you. The lectures are free and they're open to the public, as you know, but um, we do ask for advanced registration. Um, we've just scheduled the third of the Argon Out Loud uh, presentations, which will be on Thursday, November the 15th. And the speaker will be Roger Blomquist from Argonne's Nuclear Engineering Division. And he'll speak about myths about nuclear engineering, which I think will be of great interest. So just one other um, public event that I'd like to uh, bring to your attention is an energy showcase which will take place on Saturday, September the 15th, and this will focus on energy research at Argonne. It's a new venture for Argonne, and any of you who have attended any of our open houses in the past, it'll be similar in format, but smaller. So there'll be displays, presentations, you can talk to the scientists and so on. We hope that by scaling these events down, we can focus on a specific topic and do it better justice. Um, the event will be open to the public, but again, we'd like advanced registration, and if you go to Argonne's main website, you'll be able to find the link. But now I'd like to introduce Seth Darling, who's going to speak this evening. Um, as I said, he, I'm very happy that he works at the Centre for Nanoscale Materials. He holds a PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Chicago, and in fact, he has just taken up a joint appointment with the University of Chicago's Institute of Molecular Engineering. He leads strategic development of Argonne's solar energy programs, but he, and he's indeed developed new models of economics for solar energy. But his broader research interests include other types of renewable energy and nanoscience. Some of his recent studies include self-assembly of polymeric materials and advancing lithography to push semiconductor feature sizes smaller, in very important um, in these days of reduced sizes of semiconductor chips and so on. And he's also very actively doing research for next generation organic and hybrid solar energy devices. His awards and honors include um, a 2010 American Chemical Society Leadership Development Award and he was also the holder of a Glenn T. Seaborg Distinguished Fellowship, which is one of the very highest um, level postdoctoral fellowships that we offer here at Argonne. So I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming him, and the topic of his, this evening's presentation is the Solar Energy Challenge. Good evening, everybody. I'm Seth. Uh, appreciate you all coming out here. I'll do my best to keep you from falling asleep. Um, unfortunately, with the phones off, uh, that was one of my backup plans to wake you up when someone's phone went off by accident, but I guess that's not going to work. OK, so uh, I will be telling you about solar energy, but I'm actually going to spend a good chunk of the time uh, telling you about energy, uh, which I have to do to tell you why I'm going to tell you about solar energy. So this is a plot of global energy consumption, so worldwide energy usage as a function of year. One thing you'll notice right away is that we use more and more energy as time goes on. And you'll notice this is uh, going out into the future. So it's data up through 2010 and then projections going out here to the year 2030 or 2035. So today, uh, the amount of energy we're using worldwide is 17 terawatts. You don't need to know what a terawatt is other than to know that it's a lot of energy. So 17 is where we are today. And you can see by the year 2035, we're up maybe around 25 terawatts. If you continue this plot out further to the year 2050, it goes to 30 terawatts. So in other words, by the year 2050, we're going to be using twice as much energy worldwide as we're using today. And you'll also see that most of this growth is not coming from places like the United States. So the dark blue represents the developed world, if you will, the United States, Europe, uh, uh, Australia, places like that. And there's not very much growth going on there going into the future. 
Uh, that's because of increases in energy efficiency and conservation and the like. Where most of this growth is coming from is the developing world. So that's China, India, Brazil, ultimately Africa. As all those countries start coming online more and more, they're going to use more and more energy. This is essentially unavoidable. It uh, goes along with economic development. And so uh, this is a need that we're going to have to meet. We're going to need those 30 terawatts by the year 2050. So today, though, we're at 17. And let me ask you a question. Uh, where does almost all of that energy come from? Just uh, shout out where we get most of our energy from, anybody? Yes, you were all, it sounded like almost every voice I heard was correct. So fossil fuels, that's coal, oil, natural gas is where almost all of our energy comes from. One more question, and I won't ask you any more. Uh, why do we get our energy from fossil fuels? C correct, but it wasn't the answer I was looking for. Yes, cheap, I heard cheap. That's why we use fossil fuels. There's, there's lots of them in the ground, and they're cheap. We figured out how to get them out pretty efficiently uh, and to burn them and to turn them into energy that we can use uh, most often, things like electricity. So a uh, very important message I want to get across to you is, that, is this, that that energy, especially fossil energy, actually is costing you much more than you think it is. So you think it's cheap. I pay ComEd 11 cents per kilowatt hour for the electricity in my house. Gasoline may seem like it's expensive, but it actually uh, looks pretty cheap at the, uh, at the gas pump, all things considered. There are a whole bunch of costs in addition to those costs that you are paying. They're coming out of your wallet, out of your purse, um, but you don't see them, and so you don't know that they're there. And what I'm gonna do is to spend a few minutes giving you a sense for where some of those hidden costs are so that you can understand uh, what I'm talking about. But uh, there's this beautiful report. You can get this for free online. It was put out by the uh, uh, National uh, Academies. The, these are the leading scientists and engineers in the country, where they uh, tried to analyze how large are these hidden costs that come from energy. Uh, and they analyzed just the United States, and they just picked one year, 2005. And in this analysis, they actually ignored what are probably some of the largest uh, hidden costs not because they didn't think they were important, but because they couldn't come up with a good way to put a number on it, how many dollars were involved. So for example, uh, global warming climate change is not in that calculation at all, nor is um, energy security, the, the cost that we uh, incur to secure energy resources, especially when they're overseas. Um, but the number they came up with for the year 2005, ignoring most of those gigantic costs, was $120 billion uh, in that year, in the year 2005, which is a pretty big number especially considering it's ignoring uh, some of the largest costs. Okay, so uh, we use fossil fuels because they appear to be cheap. Um, and energy security uh, is one of these hidden costs. So uh, it's most obvious in the case of oil. This is a map of the world, but it's not the map of the world that you're used to seeing. This is a map that's prepared by BP. And what they've done here is they've scaled each country to represent how large uh, oil reserves they have. And this uh, does not um, have anything to do with the drill baby drill. This is all you're gonna get. So uh, you'll notice there's the United States. We're pretty small. We don't have a lot of oil here. And you'll notice, uh, probably not surprising to you, it's the Middle East that really has the bulk of the, uh, the resources. And the challenge here, of course, is that these are regions of the world that have a history of geopolitical instability, and we incur quite a significant cost uh, to secure those resources and to get them from there to here. There's additional costs, for example, piracy off the Somali coast is a cost that gets incurred uh, by the companies that are shipping oil here. That ends up leading to insurance companies shelling out large payments, so everyone who's got an insurance policy is uh, paying in some sense for that, uh, that piracy. Um, so this is a challenge for oil. We don't have a lot of oil, but that's actually uh, not the message that's most important here. It's not that we don't have enough fossil fuels, it's that we actually have too much fossil fuel worldwide. And this is especially true for gas and even more so for coal. So what's plotted here are the estimation, estimated years of supply remaining under the ground. Obviously these coal, oil, and gas are not being regenerated at any, any appreciable rate. In one year, we burn you know, millions of years worth of, uh, of development of fossil fuel. Um, and oil will probably run out in uh, you know, some of the younger folks in here's lifetime, or before it runs out, it'll become prohibitively expensive. So uh, we'll probably stop burning it in our cars at some point. 
But gas, we've got hundreds of years worth of natural gas under the ground. In this country, actually, there's a large resource in this, thanks to uh, uh, fracking technologies especially. Um, and coal, there might even be a thousand years worth of coal under the ground. So that's, for all intents and purposes, an infinite supply for the foreseeable future. Uh, so that sounds great if you're worried about energy security um, until you consider the other hidden costs associated with things like gas and especially coal. So I'm just going to mention a few of these uh, hidden costs. So here we've got oil, gas, and coal. And all of this is from, you know, ripped from the headlines in just the last, you know, year and a half, two years. So uh, everyone's familiar with the so-called BP oil spill, the Deepwater Horizon Gulf uh, oil spill, uh, released, you know, one of the largest uh, human-caused environmental uh, disasters in our history. And there's a gigantic cost associated with the cleanup of that. A lot of that's incurred by BP, but of course, that means it's incurred by us, right? I mean, they, all those costs get passed on, and there are also plenty of costs that were not incurred by BP, which get passed on through our tax dollars and so on for the, for the cleanup associated with that, or increased costs of seafood in the Gulf, for example. Uh, in the year 2010, so there's natural gas explosions all the time. They're usually, uh, you know, don't make national news because it's, you know, a house blowing up or something like that. But there was one in 2010 that really did uh, get a lot of national attention uh, in San Bruno. This is the uh, right near San Francisco International Airport. There was a huge explosion that destroyed an entire neighborhood. People died as well. Um, so there's a pretty significant cost there when an entire neighborhood uh, goes up in smoke. Uh, this one here is not uh, a representative so much of an economic cost. It's another type of cost. This would be a human cost. So I grew up in western Pennsylvania and uh, in a small town. And a lot of my friends' uh, dads worked in the coal mines. So this kind of thing hits home. This was the Upper Big Branch coal mine in West Virginia last year when a, a whole bunch of coal miners died because they were mining coal. Um, so that, you know, this doesn't show up on your electric bill. There's not, you know, a higher electric bill, but, uh, but folks died and they didn't need to. So that's fossil fuels. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about nuclear, but I think it's important to mention. So nuclear energy in general can be very safe. You know, there hasn't been a major accident in this country, uh, well, really ever and, and, uh, on this type of scale. But when there is a problem, it's a big problem, right? So this is Fukushima Daiichi uh, just last year again. Uh, you can imagine the costs incurred in having to clean this up. They're going to be cleaning it up, they say, for about 100 years. Um, so you're talking about probably even beyond the billions uh, by the time all is said and done. That's a pretty substantial hidden cost. So nuclear energy appears cheap, but when something like this happens, um, maybe not. And then, of course, there are also issues associated with uh, uh, waste handling and weapons uh, proliferation problems and so on. So there's a lot of hidden costs associated with nuclear energy as well. Big one, though, with fossil fuels is uh, global warming. And that's the last time I'm going to say the words global warming uh, in this talk because I don't actually like that term. Um, my problem with uh, global warming is that when you hear the word warming, it sounds cozy. This sounds, like, this sounds like a good thing, right? So I, I'm not a fan of that term. Uh, the one that's replaced it mostly in the, in the vernacular is climate change. You hear that term a lot probably. I'm also not that big a fan of the term climate change because uh, we all live in Chicago land here. And by the time February rolls around, climate change sounds like it's probably also a pretty good thing. Um, so I don't like that term either. The term I prefer is this one, climate disruption. This is a term that was coined uh, by John Holdren, the president's chief science advisor. And I like this term much better because it really captures the point that we are messing something up. We are disrupting the climate. OK, so I promised I'd talk more about some of these hidden costs. So uh, this coal-fired power plant here, it releases all kinds of stuff into the air. If you drove out here on I-55, for those who live in the city, you drove past uh, one or two of these coal-fired power plants. Uh, one big thing that happens is acid rain. So uh, stuff that comes out of those stacks includes uh, uh, sulfur uh, dioxide, for example, which turns into acid rain. That rain falls down and it causes significant damage to infrastructure that has metal or uh, stone. It gets corroded by uh, the acid. You can imagine how much of cost gets incurred there with all that infrastructure getting damaged over the years. There's also all kinds of things that are hazardous to our, to our health that come out, heavy metals, particulates, ozone. I'll talk about those more in a moment. And then, of course, the big one, the biggest cost, is probably these greenhouse gases, the carbon dioxide and, and a few other things that come out, uh, which are what are causing climate disruption in the first place. So uh, let me mention some of these costs that come out of your wallet, but you maybe don't realize. 
asthma and bronchitis. So things like particulates and ozone, if you live near a coal-fired power plant, if you have asthma, you've got problems. There are tens of thousands of asthma attacks every year caused by uh, emissions from coal-fired power plants, people living in the vicinity. That's a huge cost that goes into the medical system, which of course then turns into health insurance costs, which you're paying for. So all of us who have health insurance are paying for the, taking care of people who have asthma attacks because of coal-fired power plants. That's a large cost. Plenty of cases of increased rates of cancer. Things like heavy metals can cause developmental disorders, so as uh, lead and mercury and other heavy metals are getting into the uh, environment because of their emissions from coal-fired power plants, it causes problems there. And then as uh, climate disruption goes on, uh, the world is warming up. I said I wouldn't say warming again there, just warming. Uh, but what happens is as the world warms up, insects uh, become more prolific. Basically, disease becomes much more easy to spread. That's going to be a gigantic uh, health cost for, for all of us in, on the planet. Food. Uh, anybody eat salmon? Yeah. So you're eating mercury. Basically, every salmon in this country has mercury in it. That's coming, that mercury came from the coal that was in the coal-fired power plants. Um, and that's not good for you. Uh, so uh, I think pregnant women are not supposed to eat salmon at all, and even people who aren't pregnant are supposed to limit the amount of salmon they eat in a month for that reason. Uh, so that, that, that's a, a significant cost. Uh, crop yields. When you have air pollution, uh, you get fewer bushels of corn out of an acre of farmland than you would otherwise. What that means is corn costs more. Simple law of supply and demand. If you have less of something, it costs more. And so the fact that we have these lower crop yields means we're paying more at the grocery store than we would be otherwise um, because of those fossil fuels. And the one that's probably going to have the biggest impact in the food area is as climate disruption progresses along, you're going to have more droughts, more floods. That's going to have much more dramatic effects on things like crop yields, completely destroying uh, farmlands. Um, and so costs of food are going, to, are going to skyrocket, and at some point it becomes a real food supply problem. Ecosystems. So as you throw carbon up into the atmosphere, uh, the system, the, the planet, actually can absorb a lot of that extra carbon. It doesn't all stay up in the atmosphere. Uh, some of it gets absorbed in things like soils and plants. Uh, a lot of it gets absorbed in the oceans. And when you put carbon into the oceans, uh, you acidify them. You create things like carbonic acid. They become more acidic. And when you have more acidic water, it bleaches coral. So the coral reefs around the planet are all uh, suffering from, from this right now. And every creature that's in the sea that grows a shell lobster, crab, et cetera, uh, those shells get dissolved when uh, water hits a certain pH. And so uh, there's going to be uh, substantial problems with that as the water becomes more and more acidic. As you th do things like uh, eliminate the sea ice in the Arctic, there are some advantages. There are shipping lanes that open up that weren't there before, which can uh, potentially be helpful. But you're also destroying habitats of uh, wildlife up there. The polar bear is sort of the poster child for this. Um, but all across the planet, as climate disruption goes on and becomes more severe, you're going to displace more and more habitats. And all of this results in loss of biodiversity, which hurts everybody. That's a cost that you can't really put a dollar uh, figure on, um, but it's something that uh, everyone agrees, I think, should be avoided. I mentioned insurance earlier, so we all have insurance of one kind or another. And as uh, climate disruption happens, we're going to have more and more wildfires. There's the big one going on in uh, Colorado right now that you've probably heard about. Um, and it, it is true, we're having more and more severe uh, wildfires uh, with time because of climate disruption. We're also having more severe flooding, and there'll be more and larger storms. So that's hurricanes and other major storms are going to increase. The costs incurred there are in the many, many billions, up into the trillions probably, and we're all paying that on our, uh, on our insurance that we have for our own homes and the like. Uh, the last one I want to mention here is water. So energy is probably the resource, the limited resource on the planet that drives uh, you know, prosperity and, and development more than any other, but second to it would be water. And water is becoming more and more important with time because uh, there's just not that much of it on the planet, at least not fresh water. And uh, using fossil fuels is uh, destroying fresh water. Uh, and this is happening through many different routes. One is just direct pollution of things like heavy metals. That's why salmon have uh, mercury in them is because it's in the water and they live in the water. Um, but there are some that you may not be aware of. Thermal pollution is a big one. So uh, these power plants, coal-fired power plants, nuclear power plants, take huge amounts of water through them to cool them down. So you need to get them hot to boil water to make steam to turn turbines, but uh, there's too much heat there. A lot of it needs to be taken out, so you run you know, millions and millions of gallons of water through there, and it, it's not getting polluted with something like heavy metals so much, but it's getting hot when it comes out. And hot water can't hold as much oxygen in it, 
So all the aquatic life that's in those streams and wherever the water's going back into are suffering because uh, there's not as much oxygen. So populations of fish and so on uh, drop dramatically near the uh, output points of those power plants. Um, sea level rise is something that's associated with climate disruption. So uh, most people think that the sea is rising because things like uh, glaciers and Antarctica are, are uh, melting and adding water to the oceans, making them higher, which is true. But actually most of the rise comes from the fact that as the planet warms up, uh, water expands. As something gets warmer, it typically expands. Water expands. That's what's actually causing most of the sea level rise. And this is going to have uh, dramatic problems. Of course, if you live on an island, it's a really big problem. Um, but for states like Florida, uh, where they're all at um, pretty low elevation, um, this is going to become a significant issue as uh, climate disruption moves forward. Okay, so that's all the bad news. Huge costs. What can we do about it? So here I've got some boxes that are uh, different sizes and colors. And uh, what I've done is I've sized them uh, corresponding to the total worldwide feasible supply of different energy sources. So don't take these to be exact numbers, you know, plus or minus maybe 50%, I think is, is uh, I'm quite confident to say that. So uh, fossil fuels, I already said we've got a thousand years worth of coal, right? So we can get uh, more or less all the energy we need from coal for uh, quite a long time. Nuclear fission, that's the nuclear energy that we use today also could be scaled up to dramatically larger scales than we're doing today. To get to this type of scale, to get to something like 30 terawatts, you would have to build a new nuclear power plant basically every day starting today until the year 2050. And we haven't built one in this country in a long time. So that's a pretty dramatic uh, scale up. There then become issues about limited uranium on the planet and so on, but uh, uh, we won't get into that. Then we have over here the renewable energy sources wind, hydropower, and so on. And you'll notice uh, that they're not all the same size. This is important. You hear about renewable energy sources spoken sort of interchangeably in the, in the media, you know, geothermal and, and so on. But I'll, I'll pick on geothermal here. Uh, you'll notice worldwide, you really can't get that much energy. I mean, well, it's a lot of energy if you live in Iceland, where the Earth's crust is thin. They're actually an energy exporter because of that. But worldwide, it's a pretty small contributor to the total uh, global energy supply. So. This is the box that we filled today. This is 17 terawatts. And uh, the question is, how are we filling that today? And you guys answered that at the beginning. It's almost all fossil fuels. So there it is. It's almost all black. That's data from the Energy Information uh, Administration. We have a little bit of energy coming from these other sources, but it's almost all fossil fuels filling that box up today. More important question is, I have a, I have a nine-year-old. What are we going to be doing uh, in 2050 when he's middle-aged? So that's the box in 2050. It's now twice as big. And if you look at the projections for how we're going to fill it in the year 2050, it's this. And I find this to be an alarming scenario. So everything got bigger because we needed twice as much energy. But this, if you kind of squint, it looks exactly the same as it does today, right? It's still almost all fossil fuels in the year 2050. And I'm going to say right now, we will still be using fossil fuels in 2050 no matter what. There's no way we're getting rid of fossil fuels in that type of time scale. But let's just say, hypothetically, we, we could. Let's stop using fossil fuels altogether, and let's not use nuclear for the reasons I said before. What if we only wanted to use these renewable energy sources? How much could we possibly get if I empty all of those boxes, everything that we can get worldwide, feasibly, anywhere, and it's that much without solar? So I'm not filling this box, right? So even if we do all the wind power, all the biomass, all the geothermal, everything we can, everywhere on the planet, it's not getting us there. So how big is that solar resource? So now we get to solar energy. OK, so now instead of boxes, I have circles. So this is a circle. It's just too big to fit on the screen. And that's how much energy hits the surface of the Earth from the sun all the time. And it's a huge amount of energy. There's enough energy from the sun hitting the Earth in one hour to power the entire planet for a year. But that's kind of a useless thing to say, because we can't get all of the energy from the sun. So uh, therefore, we're not going to use that giant blue circle because that makes no sense at all. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out the oceans because we're not going to put solar panels all over the oceans. That's not feasible. So here's the land area now. We've scaled down to a smaller circle. And of course, we can't cover all the land area with solar panels. You know, you need farms, you need roads, and so on. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say 2% of the land. Is anybody from Kansas? One. Sorry. We're going to put them all in Kansas. No. <laughs> We're not going to put them all in Kansas. I just wanted to show you 2% of the United States is about that much area. 
2% is how much area is covered by roads in this country. So it's feasible. We can cover 2% of the land with stuff. Uh, it's a lot of land area. One could pro feasibly probably do more. You could probably do 5%, but I'm just going to pick 2% as a number. And now we have another problem. So that scaled us down to a much smaller circle. Now we have another problem, though, which is that you can't convert sunlight to electricity with 100% efficiency. There are just fundamental limits in how good you can do that. Um, for a typical solar cell, you can, the best you could ever do is about 30%. Um, you can buy commercial panels for your roof today that work at 20%. Um, but I'm going to make a more conservative estimate. I'm going to say 12%. So that's a very feasible number to achieve. So we've taken this number uh, down to a much smaller circle. You can see where we started and where we are now. Tiny little circle, right? But that tiny little circle is this yellow box. So that feasible solar energy supply around the planet is more than twice as large as the total projected energy demand for the year 2050. That doesn't mean we should get all of our energy from solar energy. We should always have a mix for a number of reasons. But the point is that the potential supply here is far, far larger than any of the other renewables put together. And that's why we really need to pay attention to solar energy. I find this uh, article interesting and humbling at the same time. So this is from Science Magazine, sort of the uh, penultimate uh, journal in, in the field of science. And look at the date. 1912, for those who can't read that. It's 100 years ago, almost exactly. And I'm going to read this quote for you. If our black and nervous civilization based on coal, we're still based on coal, shall be followed by a quieter civilization based on the utilization of solar energy that will not be harmful to progress and to human happiness. So first of all, we don't write articles like that anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty poetic. Uh, but more importantly, he understood even then, this is before there was any concept of anthropogenic climate disruption, he already understood that coal was not good. It's dirty, it's nasty, we, we shouldn't be using it. That was 100 years ago. He said then we should use solar, and that's also, by the way, before they knew about solar panels. Um, he was right then, and it's even more true today 100 years later. It's about time we, we listened up. Okay, so where are we today? If you wanted to buy uh, solar panels and put them on your roof, you basically have three choices. They can be made out of silicon, out of cadmium telluride, or out of something called SIGs, which stands for copper, indium, gallium, diselenide. That's a mouthful. That's why we say SIGs. Um, each of these has some pretty serious challenges associated with it. So most solar panels that are made today are made out of silicon. And an advantage of silicon is that the planet's got a lot of silicon on it. Sand is silica, so there's you know, plenty of silicon around. Um, but it takes a lot of energy and money to convert those raw materials into high-performance silicon solar panels. And it costs more than it costs to get electricity from coal. That's why you don't have them on your roof today. Well, maybe some of you do, but most of you don't. Uh, it's because it's expensive. And they're getting a little bit cheaper with time, those silicon uh, solar panels, uh, but they're not getting cheaper fast enough to deal with all of these issues that I've been talking about. So there's some newer kids on the block uh, that are cheaper than silicon. Uh, one example is cadmium telluride. Um, there's two problems with cadmium telluride, cadmium and telluride. <laughs> so cadmium is a toxic heavy metal. It's like mercury and lead and so on. This is um, you know, not something you want to eat. Um, not that you eat solar panels, but when you put enough of these things out there, you're talking about putting a lot of heavy metals out into the, uh, into the ecosystem. At some point, you're going to have a problem. But actually, the bigger problem is this one, the tel telluride. That's tellurium. It's an element on the periodic table, and it's the ninth rarest element on the planet Earth. Uh, so there's enough tellurium for now to, uh, you know, for the companies that make these things to, to make some money, but you're never going to get multiple terawatts of energy from cadmium telluride solar cells because there's just not enough tellurium on the planet. You can't get around that. SIGs. This is the other new kid on the block, the copper, indium, gallium, diselenide. And here your problems are the I and the G. That's indium and gallium, which are also very rare elements on the planet Earth. Also not enough of those. They're already becoming more expensive. Uh, to make huge amounts of solar panels out of these things. So that's it. This is what's commercially available. And I just told you that none of them are really solving our problem. So that brings us to places like Argonne National Laboratory. So this is where we come in. What we really want is large-scale use, right? We want terawatts of energy to come from solar. And let me tell you, we're a long way from that today. So worldwide, there's you know, fewer than 50 gigawatts installed of uh, solar power, which sounds like a lot of gigawatts. But, um, you know, a gigawatt is one thousandth of a terawatt. So we're a very, very long way from uh, making a significant impact with solar today, unless you live in, say, Germany. Um, 
but to get to this large scale use, what you need is low cost and highly scalable, abundant materials. We need new materials, novel materials that can be used in solar panels. And so that's what we do here is we do a lot of development of new materials. We put those things into solar cells. We see how they work and there's a feedback loop there. You know, if it didn't work well enough, you redesign your material, but you can't stop there. That's where maybe a typical academic lab might stop. You can get lots of scientific papers and uh, learn lots of cool stuff, but you're not gonna change the world making you know, one solar cell. You need to be able to scale it up to thousands or millions of them, which means that you need to do process engineering. That's scaling things up. Also something we're strong at here at Argonne. And as you do that, you're gonna probably need to redesign your materials again, because your processes or materials may not be compatible with those high throughput uh, approaches. And so you need this full feedback loop, and ultimately then, the idea is to feed these technologies out to the commercial market. We're not a company, we don't make and sell stuff. We develop the technology and hand it off to the folks who, who make and sell stuff. So I'm just gonna quickly mention a few of the uh, examples of the things we're doing in these different areas. So one approach is to make really cheap solar panels. And uh, if you saw the poster in the back by my colleague Alex Martinson, part of it addressed uh, disensitized solar cells. This is one of the uh, newer technologies that is, involves low cost. Um, one that I'm particularly interested in, because it's the one that I research, is uh, organic solar cells. And this isn't organic like an uh, apple at Whole Foods. This is organic, meaning it's made from organic molecules, carbon-based uh, molecules like polymers and, um, and other uh, organic molecules. And these are organic solar cells. So I'll actually pass this one around, and I'll hold the other one in my hand so I can look impressive. <laughs> I can hold that one. Um, so one thing you'll notice immediately is that this is very different from your traditional solar panel, right? They're normally big, rigid glass things that get bolted onto a rooftop um, and, and are expensive and cumbersome and people have to be, have all kinds of training to install them and so on. I'm not that strong, this is not heavy. Um, and you can see it's mechanically flexible, very thin. Um, and what's really cool about these is that they can be printed super cheap. So what you do here is you have a roll of, you know, basically plastic on one side, and it goes through a machine, and it uh, coats down uh, the organic materials that make the active layer. That's the sort of reddish color that you see. And then it gets laminated, uh, and you've basically got yourself a solar cell. And you can imagine how fast that can be. Think the way uh, newspapers are printed. Just flying by, uh, you can make these things really fast, really cheap. The problem with them today uh, is that they don't work as well as those silicon and cadmium telluride and so on. The efficiency is lower. And so that's where research comes in. So folks here at Argonne and all over the planet are trying to understand how these things work and how to make them work better. So there's another way uh, to lower the cost of solar energy though. So one way is you make a cheap solar panel like the one I just showed you. There's another way though, which is maybe you have a expensive solar cell, but it's really high efficiency and you don't wanna make a big area out of it because it's expensive, so you have small ones. But if there was a way to get light from a large area, sunlight over a large area, and bring it to that solar cell, then you could still be cheap because you don't have a very big solar cell. And the traditional way that you would do that is you would have uh, lenses or mirrors that track the sun as it moves through the sky and focus, the, you know, think magnifying glass and ant, except maybe nicer for the planet. Um, uh, right onto the solar cell, uh, and those actually work pretty well if you live in you know, Arizona or Italy or places where it's clear skies most of the time. Uh, they are expensive because you need tracking equipment, um, but they work pretty well. Um, but in places like Chicago, I guess it's pretty nice today, but a lot of the times, as you know, it's not uh, sunny here, and so those things don't work at all when you have clouds. What we're developing here is a technology called luminescent solar concentrators, and these things are very cool. They're basically a plastic slab, so uh, cheap, clear plastic slab, which has embedded within it or maybe coated on top of it a material that can absorb light from just about any direction, and then it re-emits that light and it gets trapped inside the slab. It's a principle called total internal reflection, and the light just bounces down the slab until it gets to the end where you have your solar cell. So you could tile large areas with cheap materials and bring all that light to your high efficiency, maybe expensive, but very small uh, solar cells. So it's another way to lower costs. And you can also do cool stuff like stack them on top of each other where you pick apart the solar spectrum, the different energies of light that come from the sun into different pieces. So you take the high energy light, the medium energy light, and the low energy light and different layers in the stack and feed them to solar cells that are optimized uh, for those energies so you can get some pretty high efficiency out of these things. In terms of looking at process engineering, uh, one area of great strength here at Argonne is a technique called atomic layer deposition, which again was uh, highlighted on one of the posters in the back. 
so this is a uh, way to deposit materials, uh, very thin layers that are uh, completely pinhole free. And you can do it with lots of different materials. There are many ways that this can be used for solar energy. One that uh, is very interesting to me personally uh, deals with organic photovoltaics. So I mentioned the efficiency of these guys is uh, not that good. There's another problem, which is when you, uh, you have the organic materials in here, when they're exposed to water and oxygen and ultraviolet light, all of which you're exposed to on a rooftop, you get chemical reactions which degrade the polymers and they stop working well. So this, if I put it out on a roof today, would last a year, maybe two years before it stopped working. So that's not good enough. And one way to get around that is to keep the water and the oxygen out. And you can imagine if you can lay down uh, layers that are completely pinhole free and highly transparent, um, you can keep all the water and oxygen out. So that's uh, one exciting avenue. We're also looking at scaling up organic photovoltaics. So instead of making little devices like this, making things like what you see here and doing all the science and engineering involved in that. So I didn't mention this green box earlier, systems modeling, uh, but this is very important. This is a, a, actually a big effort here at Argonne is in this area of systems modeling. And one of the areas that we do this in solar is, uh, pertains to environmental impact. So any technology you're gonna roll out at a large scale is gonna have some bad environmental impact. It's unavoidable. So we know, I talked in great detail about the negative environmental impacts of coal and, and, and natural gas and so on. But solar also has negative environmental impacts. So uh, one that's been in the news lately is uh, they're trying to build big utility scale solar farms in California out in the desert. Sounds like a great idea, right? Lots of sun, uh, no people, no buildings. Um, so it's a great place to put uh, a solar farm and get lots of energy. But uh, there is something there and it's desert tortoises. And desert tortoises are endangered. And so you build huge solar farms, taking away their habitat, speaking of habitat displacement, you're gonna probably kill off desert tortoises, which is something we don't wanna do. Now, it is of course important to point out that if you don't build utility scale solar farms, you're probably gonna build a new coal fired power plant, which is gonna do an awful lot more damage to the environment than the solar farm will. But nonetheless, you wanna minimize your environmental impact. So the federal government has a huge amount of land in the Southwest, well, all over the country, but especially in the Southwest, where there's a beautiful solar resource, lots of sun. And you companies could, in principle, lease that land and put out utility scale solar farms, but they don't in large part because to get a permit to do so, to get permission from the government to do so, uh, you need to do an environmental impact assessment. And most companies don't have the resources or expertise to do that kind of thing. It would take a long time, so they don't do it. So the Bureau of Land Management and the Department of Energy uh, partnered up with Argonne to uh, look at all of these federal lands and analyze the environmental impact of utility scale solar across some two or three dozen uh, environmental areas or things that you may not even think of as environmental areas like uh, paleontological issues, uh, Native American rights questions, um, aesthetic issues and so on, as well as more traditional environmental impact like wildlife and water resources and all of that. And what they did is they could identify which regions in the Southwest you would have the smallest environmental impact and then those areas can have essentially pre-approved uh, permission to go and build a utility scale solar farm. So it's a way of uh, making it more feasible to um, get large scale solar out there. Another thing we do is uh, measuring real world performance of solar cells. And this is a project uh, in cooperation with the Illinois Tollway Authority. So any, any of you who drove here on a toll road, you gave them some money and, and uh, it's either putting some of it to good use. So uh, this is actually, you can go see this. This is a facility on Ogden Avenue right near the intersection of I-88 and I-355. And what it is is the, uh, a photovoltaics analysis facility, a solar cell analysis facility. We have every commercial technology here basically. That's cadmium telluride, single crystal silicon, polycrystalline silicon, amorphous silicon. These are SIGs panels and these are actually organic photovoltaic modules here. Just as an aside, these are Solyndra SIGs panels. So I don't know if you guys follow the news, Solyndra doesn't exist anymore, so I'm crossing my fingers, none of those stop working, because we're not getting more of them. Um, but what we're doing here is we also have a weather station that's measuring uh, sunlight insulation and temperature and so on. And uh, we're gonna get comparative real world performance of all these different technologies. And the reason this is so uh, important is that you need to know what is the right technology for this part of the world. If you asked me, solar energy researcher, what type of panel should you buy for your roof if you wanted to buy some, I really don't have an educated answer to that because the data doesn't exist. There's not data here for the Midwest on the comparative performance of these different technologies. There's some of that data exists for places like Arizona, but this isn't Arizona. Um, so we're gonna start collecting that data and uh, keep your eyes open. Hopefully in a, in a couple of months, some of that'll be uh, posted publicly so you'll be able to see how we're doing. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over that. 
I just wanted to mention um, that everything I told you about so far is photovoltaic, solar cells, which is only one way to take solar energy and, and do something useful with it. It's a great way, but it's not the only way. So there's another way, which we also uh, study here at Argonne, which is called concentrated solar power. This is using those mirrors and things like that that I mentioned earlier to focus sunlight onto a tube with a fluid in it, which gets really, really hot, and then there goes through a heat exchanger, boils water, turns turbines, makes electricity. Works pr pretty well, it's conversion efficiencies in the range of about 15%, uh, and that's a commercialized technology, but we're making it better here. There's also one that's caught some attention in the media recently called an updraft tower, where huge facilities that basically heat up air, cause convection to happen, again, turn turbines to make electricity. But all of these make electricity. And electricity is you know, where a lot of our energy goes. It's, it's um, a very useful form of energy. Uh, but there are certain applications where electricity is not going to cut it. Uh, transportation is a big one of those. So if you have electric cars, electricity will help you. So for cars, that's great as we all start driving things like the Volt and the Leaf. Um, as long as that power is coming from things like wind and solar, uh, we're really making a big impact. Um, but there are parts of the transportation sector that you cannot electrify. Uh, large trucks and certainly jet airplanes are never going to be uh, powered by batteries. And what you need is chemical fuels, which have a much higher energy density. Now we get to energy density. You mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and there are ways that you can take sunlight and make a chemical fuel. Most of the chemical fuel, of course, comes from oil today. Uh, plants have been doing that for billions of years. It's called photosynthesis. Um, photosynthesis actually is not very efficient for making fuel, but we can learn things from Mother Nature and uh, sort of re-engineer them for our purposes. That's what's called biomimetic approaches to making uh, solar fuels. And then there are also other approaches that are uh, just taking the light and coming up with our own ideas on ways to make fuels out of that. Um, you can also just use the light itself, right? This is another way to use energy. If you use natural lighting, build that into your architecture, you're gonna use less electricity because you're not turning lights on. So in, in effect, that's another form of solar energy. Um, and then another big one, which is used more in other parts of the world than in the United States, is uh, solar thermal. Biggest one would be water heating. There are parts of the world, uh, Israel for example, a lot of homes get their um, hot water from uh, systems like this on their rooftops that get heated up by the sun, that makes the hot water, and um, they don't have to have any uh, energy cost of their own to make uh, hot water for their home, and there are lots of other things you can do like this as well. So, uh, with that, I'm gonna give you a chance to ask me some questions. I've already gone over time. Uh, but I wanted to uh, mention this uh, website. If you go to this address, you'll find uh, sort of an introduction to solar, some of the stuff I showed you earlier, but also a lot of details about uh, some of the research that's going on here at Argonne in much more detail than I was able to present for you today. And you can also find contact information for me or, or my colleagues uh, if you have questions for us, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, what's the approximate efficiency on these organic solar cells that you were mentioning? So uh, the one that's being passed around right there, which is uh, rigorously not a cell, it's a, it's a module, it's an actual panel, that thing is uh, only about 3% conversion efficiency. But in the lab, um, the current record for you know, a, a single little uh, organic solar cell is over 10%, which is actually pretty darn good. If you could make that thing at 10%, uh, you'd make a lot of money. I understand that quite a bit of the energy that is generated is lost in transmission. Now, with the solar mode, or whatever the other renewable sources that we are talking about, the energy generation, I guess, can be localized. So what kind of a consumption is actually needed in reality if we exclude the transmission costs and how efficient are these? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, the point is the electrical grid that we have now is designed uh, for centralized energy production, right? We have power plants located somewhere and then they spread out the electricity from there to homes and businesses and so on. When you start moving to things like solar, as, as the best example is you can have distributed power. It's a totally different model for the grid, right? You're now generating power om almost at the point of use and we're gonna need a much smarter grid to deal with that, which is a, which is a related question uh, to accommodate you know, having so many different sources and, and, and how to optimize that system. Um, but there is also the advantage that you don't have these losses. So as electricity travels along power lines, you lose some of the, some of the energy because stuff heats up and, and that energy is lost. Um, there are some technologies that can do better power transmission. So superconducting uh, wires, for example, have, are zero loss. 
And so if we can find cheap and effective ways to make large lengths of superconducting uh, transmission lines, we can eliminate that as a problem. But as we have distributed power, we'll need less long distance transmission, so we'll have fewer losses. I don't have a number off the top of my head for you know, how much better we'll be able to do, but it will be better as we have distributed power. You didn't talk about the uh, ugly problem of the sun not shining at night. Uh, how, do you, how do you store your solar power? Great question. I was ready for that one. <laughs> I got lots of answers for you. OK. So yes, the sun doesn't shine all the time, and the wind doesn't blow all the time, right? So we have these variable energy sources. Right now, it's not a problem on our grid, because there's so little uh, sun and wind power on the grid. You know, sun is well below 1%, and uh, you know, wind is maybe at a couple percent. Um, it's not enough to, those variations are not enough to cause a problem, but as it becomes more and more, you know, up around 10% or so, you start having issues with this variability if you don't do anything. So here's one thing you can do, is have complementary energy sources. So you were right, the sun does not shine at night, very observant, uh, but the wind often doesn't blow during the day. The wind blows more at night than it does during the day, and so these are actually nicely complementary energy sources. Uh, wind and solar go well together. Another thing we can do is better with forecasting. So on the grid right now, there's a whole lot of stuff called spinning power, which a lot of people don't realize. These are power plants that are running all the time and throwing away their energy, which sounds stupid. But the reason they do it is to, so we don't have brownouts or blackouts. When there's a big spike in demand, you don't want all the lights to go off, right? And so they have this extra power running all the time so they can quickly uh, pull from it when they need it. Um, and you can imagine if you have more and more variable energy sources, you would need more and more of that spinning power. That's a problem. So if you know, though, ahead of time, very well when you're going to have clouds, when you're going to have wind at different speeds and so on, you can be prepared ahead of time and only fire up your extra power when you need it instead of having so much spinning power all the time. Another thing you can do is interconnection. So yes, uh, you might have a cloudy day in Chicago, but it might be sunny in Indianapolis. And so if you have solar panels that are interconnected well across geographically dispersed areas, you can move power around as needed to accommodate uh, drops in power. Another thing is we're all used to uh, getting our energy right when we say we want it. But there are things we can do that are a little bit smarter. So I picked a picture of a, a clothes dryer because it's a good example, which is that uh, you, know, you don't need your clothes to dry necessarily right when you push the button. It can go, you could dry them in the middle of the night so they're ready in the morning when there's a lot less demand for energy. So if you start shifting your energy usage for those applications where you can shift it, obviously, you want your computer to turn on when you flip the switch, but some things you don't need to be like that. Uh, then you can, you know, if there's a spike in demand and, you know, because, and there's a drop in supply because of clouds or so on, shifting loads can help accommodate that. Another one is oversizing. So we need 30 terawatts in the year 2050. There's no reason we can't build up to, say, 32 terawatts. And then you've got extra energy around that you're able to pull on when you need it, when there's a, a, a drop in, in wind or so on. And then the one that you mentioned is storage. So uh, this is definitely something we're going to want to do. And there's lots of ways you can store uh, solar energy. One way is in batteries. We can have huge battery banks on the grid, which is not something we're really doing today, but we could do. But there are also things uh, that are going to naturally happen. As more and more people drive electric cars, that's the Chevy Volt uh, right there, uh, all those electric cars can actually serve as battery banks for the grid. So you wouldn't want it to, you know, to pull all of the energy out of your battery. But in the middle of the night, for example, if it needed to pull some of your ba battery power and then give it back, you wouldn't care. And that would help when uh, level out this uh, variability. And then there are other ways you can do storage, too. It doesn't have to be batteries. You can store as chemical fuels. You can pump water up to higher uh, elevations. You can compress air. There are lots of ways you can store energy. We will need to do much more of that as we go forward. That was a long-winded answer, but I had the slides. So I wanted to use it. What are your thoughts on LED lighting? Uh, solid state lighting is fantastic. So, so we all had a incandescent bulbs for a long time, and those things are they're something like 90 or 95 percent heat and only you know, a couple percent light coming out of that. So most of the energy we're throwing away. Now we've switched to compact fluorescents, which are better, uh, but better still is solid state lighting, LEDs, which are very, very efficient, you know, approaching 100 percent efficiency in some cases. And, um, it turns out that a lot of the stuff we learn from uh, photovoltaics, from solar cells, is uh, very complementary knowledge to solid state lighting because they're actually inverse processes, if you think about it. A solar cell takes light and gives you electricity. Solid state lighting takes electricity and gives you light. 
And so many of the same materials and, and underlying concepts can translate from one to the other, and there are actually a lot of research groups do both for that reason. Uh, the, the one thing you were talking about is how our infrastructure, of oh, our energy infrastructure at least, is built, you know, very centralized. Has there been much discussion of, you know, say this all comes true, which is fine and good, but how easily our infrastructure would be able to adapt to this, our energy infrastructure? Yeah, so, the, yeah, I mean, the current grid is not going to cut it. It's a, it's a very old grid that is incredibly impressive how well it works, actually, considering its age. Uh, you know, really smart people have engineered that, that thing to death. Uh, but it's not going to cut it as we have more and more uh, renewable energy sources. And so, yeah, there's an enormous amount of research that needs to go into developing the so-called smart grid. And that's all the way from, you know, smarter meters on your house that can vary pricing, you know, based on demand. So that'll affect your behavior. You might change, you know, use less power when it's more expensive in your house, for example. Um, all the way up to how power actually moves around the grid, like the type of interconnection and stuff that I was talking about. So all that needs to happen. Um, we're a long way from doing that. We need to start that research today, just like uh, all the research that I talk about on uh, photovoltaics. Excuse me, can you explain something about the budget part of it? How much budget budgets do you have for the research? And if we had more budget and how much more you can do what? And if it is a, <laughs> if, every, it, if it is a political issue. Every dollar you give me, I can make good use of. Um, how, how much you need? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, budgets for scientific research in general have been under a lot of strain recently, as the economy has turned down especially. And so, um, you know, that's something that scientists struggle with all the time, is uh, trying to make the best use of the dollars that we have and trying to figure out how we can convince folks, you guys, you're the taxpayers, it's your dollars that we're spending, uh, that we're doing it well, and that, uh, you know, if you gave us more resources, we could do more good stuff to, to help everybody out, um, you know. I'll have to leave it at that. I like money too, but how do you measure efficiency here? How do you know it's 10% efficient or 12% efficient? Yeah, so uh, it turns out there's an easy answer to that. So for a solar cell, uh, we have something called a solar simulator, which um, is a fancy name for a lamp um, that basically uh, gives you sunlight. So it has a filter and a certain type of lamp and it produces a standardized spectrum which simulates sunlight and uh, you can measure the current and voltage properties of your solar cell under this standardized illumination, and that's where the, num the percentages I'm talking about are when they're under that so-called one sun, a standard amount of light, and so that the results I get in my lab, I can compare to some other, someone else's lab, you know, elsewhere in the country or anywhere around the world. We all have the same light in this standard device, and so we can all compare our results with these uh, power conversion efficiencies. In the end, of course, though, you don't want to know how well it performs under your lamp in the lab, you want to know how well it performs on your rooftop, and that's why you need real-world data also, which is why we're doing things like partnering with the tollway to collect that information for this region. Ultimately, you need that data from all over the planet. Um, on the uh, LED lighting, how come if you go to a store and look at LED light bulbs, the only things you can find are things like 12 lumens that turn out to be like one watt? <laughs> Um, so yeah, so uh, LED lights right now are expensive, um, although if you consider how long they're supposed to last, which in most cases is like the lifetime of your house, um, you know, they're actually not that expensive as long as they really do last that long. Um, but watch out for the wattage rating. Remember, it's, um, you know, the watts that it's pulling is going to be much, much, much lower because it's so much more efficient. So, you know, a one watt LED is the equivalent of a very bright incandescent bulb. Yeah, that's a dim pump. <laughs> you can, I mean, you can get lights for your ceiling that are uh, essential drop-in replacements for something like a compact fluorescent, but they're, they're expensive. And also the color quality isn't uh, quite as good. Some people complain about LED light color quality not being the same, especially like in a bathroom or in the mirror. It makes you, makes you look bad. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, there are lots of people doing research in that area. I'm not an expert on it, so I don't know the, the details. Hello. I, I worked on batteries about 40 years ago, and one of the ideas we had was that um, we were going to be uh, storing the energy in the houses themselves. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, individual uh, homes would have that. Yes. Uh, has that idea been thrown away? No, no, that's a commercial technology. You can do that, actually. If you put solar panels on your roof, you can buy uh, banks of batteries. They look like a washing machine, basically, that would sit in your house somewhere. 
and you can store that. So if you want to be off the grid, if you're like, you know, survivalist do, do you master envision, and you don't you want envision, to be on the grid. Do you envision more of that going on as, as Sure, so, so storage, yeah, I mean, I think it remains to be seen what proportion of local storage versus large scale grid storage somewhere else uh, makes more sense. That requires folks who know more about uh, electricity grids than I know. Um, but probably some mixture of the two is going to be the answer. If you were talking to young people today, what disciplines or fields would you recommend for, for them to pursue? Yeah. In order if they to, want to do solar energy in order research? To, yeah, in order to keep this thing going. Uh, that's actually a, an interesting question. So, um, so I, I know a lot of people who work on solar energy, and um, they come from many, many different fields. So uh, it's actually one of the fun things about this research area, especially organic photovoltaics, is that it draws on uh, chemistry, it draws on physics, it draws on electrical engineering, it draws on material science, chemical engineering. It, it's a little bit of all of that. And so postdocs who've worked with me have come from almost all of those disciplines that I've mentioned. Um, it almost doesn't matter anymore. Uh, you know, you, you need to get sort of a sound foundation in science and engineering and, uh, you know, go work on an exciting problem, I guess. One of the, uh, the way you started was with the increase in the usage the, or demand for uh, energy. And one other possibility is that there won't be such an increase in demand. And if we either live differently or, uh, you know, find other ways to live without using so much energy. Is that part of the equation yeah. something you've been so thinking about? Yeah, it's important to point out that the data I showed, the projections, actually are already assuming we're going to be doing basically everything we can in terms of energy efficiency and conservation. So that is, by the way, the cheapest and easiest way to uh, address the uh, demand problem is to use less energy. And so we all need to drive cars that have higher mileage and, uh, or higher miles per gallon, I mean, and, um, you know, more efficient appliances and so on. Um, but as you saw, the majority of that growth is coming from developing world. These are people who aren't using much of energy energy today, and they're going to be using it. And it's, they're not being wasteful. You know, they want to have a light bulb. Um, and so that growth is unavoidable, I think, unless you foresee populations plummeting on the planet, which maybe is a worse problem. Uh, sort of related to that, on your graph, the, it looked like the energy demand just went off you know, forever uh, exponentially. Is there, is there a theoretical limit to how much energy we, we would end up consuming, or d does it indeed go off uh, if going, keep going forever? So projections, that the furthest projections I've seen for energy usage are out to the year 2100, and it continues to grow out to 2100. Um, and they're all, the, po the world's population is also continuing to grow at a pretty alarming pace. And I think what's going to uh, hit us before... Um, we run out of supplies of energy, assuming we start tapping things like solar more than we are, is other problems on the planet. The, you know, food is something that we all need, water. Um, those are probably going to um, be the things that really limit that population growth more than energy supply is. What energy supply really limits is development. And in fact, supplying more energy often helps with uh, population because as you have more development, you have more education, things like that, that tends to reduce um, population growth statistics. So uh, it might actually help us by having more energy. Considering the decrease, uh, the losses due to the low efficiency of the, of the solar panels, how much energy would you have to absorb from the sun to notice a change in global climate temperature? Ah, so you want to know, are we going to warm up the planet because, yeah, someone asked me that question before and I, I don't know, I haven't seen a study that's actually looked at those numbers. My best answer to that is probably going to be if we get to a point where that's our concerns, we're in much better shape than we're going to be otherwise. Um, there are also questions about wind turbines. As you build more and more wind turbines, you're actually slowing down wind speeds. You're going to change weather patterns if you scale it up to a big enough scale. And is that a, we don't know what that effect is going to be. It might be good. It might be bad. You know, the alternative of just continuing to burn coal is going to be an awful lot worse. So it's stuff we need to figure out and manage, but um, they're not the biggest concerns. Have you heard of technologies such as solar paint, and what are your opinions on the matter? Yeah, so uh, solar paint is something people have talked about for a while. The idea here is materials like maybe organics or other materials that uh, are in a solution uh, that can be just you know painted onto your rooftop to turn your rooftop into a solar panel. Um, so probably one day we will get there. Um, we're a long way off 
from that today. Um, I think, you know, in, in, in the time scale that we need to address the energy challenge, uh, probably we're, we, we don't want to wait for solar paint. Um, probably in your lifetime, uh, there will be such a technology, but uh, it's not going to happen in the next, you know, 10, 20 years, uh, which is really what we need here. At this point, I think we'll stop the questioning, um, and I'd like you to join me in thanking Seth again for a fascinating talk.